Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Holly from Los Angeles, and my sobriety date is February 8, 1972. And I am thrilled to be here, and thank you, Jerry, for the invitation, and thank you for your friendship. Uh, It has meant a lot to me over the years to talk to somebody on the other side of the country and see how you do it there. Um, I think that you are probably a little bit more enthusiastic than we are, and that's pretty wonderful. Um, I am uh, enthusiastic about this program because it's kept me safe and sane, well, no, safe and sober, I would say. Uh, for uh, close to 50 years. If I live to um, February 8th, that will be half a century of sobriety, and that attests to really huge power in this this fellowship, and it's available to us. Our primary purpose really is to, uh, to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And if we do that, if we just simply do that as our uppermost goal, then good things seem to happen. Um, I like your name, the primary purpose group, and it just gets us back to to the basics. Um, I just wandered into this fellowship many years ago uh, after quite a few years of doubting that I had a problem with alcohol (laughs) and that it seems to be the story of many of us, of course. Um, and a lot of it is um, related to this whole thing, this mysterious thing in our program, which is uh, coming to believe in and having a relationship with a higher power. And I've become convinced that we always have some kind of higher power, something that dominates our life, that gives purpose and direction to our life. And for me, for many years, it was lesser powers. Um, And uh, I was certainly an atheist pretty much from the start. Um, But I believed in science, and I wanted to be a scientist. And that was a a higher power. Um, Not a bad higher power, because it gave direction to my life. I liked to learn about it, and I went away to study it. And I just thought that if I could become a scientist, then I would finally be a happy person. I was in Ohio, the place that's completely frozen these days, I hear. And um, and there were snowstorms then, but there were also summers when I could go out and lie in the grass. And I'd look up at the sky, and uh, it was a, I was in kind of a rural place, so I could see lots of stars, and I used to think, what in the world is it all about? And, and if there was an answer, I thought it would be found in science. But I was still just crazy and miserable, and I didn't get along with people. I had absolutely no ability to engage in the kind of small talk that people make, these friendly people in Ohio. My family, I mean, they were all happy, normal people. I'm the only alcoholic in the family. And they would sit around and Every now and then they'd have a few drinks even, and then they'd set them down and lose them and talk to one another. And I was just that weird child that would come into the room and want to tell them about my jar full of insects. And uh, they would just uh, kind of turn away and find somebody else to talk to. And that was the story of my life. So I was lying there in the field looking at, at the stars, trying to think of what it's all about and couldn't figure it out. But finally, I saw the answer on a bumper sticker, and it is, life is hard and then you die. And that was that was good. That was an answer. But I found that that was way too optimistic because life is hard and it just goes on and on and seems to get harder. <laughs> so it needed a longer bumper sticker. Um, but anyway, I, I had hope for science and I just thought if I, if I could be a scientist, at least I could talk to other scientists. And so my mother was saintly. She was a widow, essentially. My dad was in a, 
a terrible auto accident when I was a small child. And he lay in a vegetative state for 12 years. And so my mom went out and was working for uh, the government, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And, and, uh, and she was, as I said, just saintly. We didn't have very much money at all, but she did save enough so that I, I could go away to school and study. And because we were poor, I had to get a job when I got there to help pay for my education. And there was a science laboratory, the Fermi Institute, that just sounded ever so special. And so I went to apply for a job there. And there were a few openings, and I had to take a test. And the test involved a microscope, was scanning nuclear emulsions to look for high energy particles. And oh my gosh, that kind of thing just sent chills down my spine. It sounded so exotic. And somebody, a very tall, pale guy, came out to give me a test to see if I could get the job. And he had a white lab coat on. And he had a slide rule in his pocket. And you young folks, a slide rule is what we used instead of calculators in those days. We actually moved pieces of wood past one another (laughs) to multiply numbers. (laughs) It was like an abacus. And, I mean, in in my lifetime, we've moved from just calculating by moving little boards around to to a cell phone where you can know weather reports, contact the Internet, do all the science you want to do on the calculator, and a myriad of other things, order a ride from the airport. (laughs) It's just so remarkable that time has, has... led to that so we were way back in the dark ages and um and so I took the, this test and I was just so enchanted enchanted with with the laboratory with the scientist oh my gosh I saw that slide rule in his pocket and I knew that I just I had to grab and fondle his slide rule and uh I got that job right by the way um and uh we went on to work together, and and we sort of spoke the same language. We we could talk about Gegenbauer polynomials and the theory of relativity, and no man had ever talked to me like that before. And I was falling in love, and one day he said, do you want to get married? And I, of course, said, yes. And I was just beginning my education, and he was winding his up. He was eight years older, and yet it was kind of a match. And uh, So we went back to Ohio. His dad was a Lutheran minister. Now, Bill and I were both scientists and atheists, but here we were in this little religious ceremony, and his dad was saying those magic words about better or worse. He should have emphasized worse in in sickness and in health. And Bill said, I do, and just had no idea what he was agreeing to. And I heard those things, and... I, of course, said, I do. And it just meant, let me attach to you like a tick on a dog and drain out your life. And uh, proceeded to do just that. And that was that was love. For me, love was sick and hideous parasitism because that was the only thing I knew. Just attach and kind of beat your soul. Um it took the form of grabbing Bill by the lapels and screaming, you don't love me, you don't love me. And he would say something like, what do you want? And I would say, well, you never take me skiing. And he would say, well, let's go skiing. And I would say, no, no, because you didn't think of it first. And this was life. And Bill took a job uh, because he was finishing his education and we moved to Los Angeles, where he took a job at a university there and was a physics professor. And by that time, I was a graduate student with a research project. And I was in a lab, and I had my own white lab coat, and I had my own slide rule. And I had a set of reagents, and I had a research project that involved muscle protein. And I was more miserable than ever. I was doing science. 
and I was with a group of scientists. It was in a very good lab. The director was quite a, a really a wonderful scientist. And many people had come there to work with him. And you would think that, that well, it was. It was the ideal spot for somebody who wanted an academic career in science. And yet I was there, and I was more miserable than ever. And I felt like a fraud. I had felt like a fraud all of my life. I'm just pretending to be whatever I happened to be at that moment. And uh, the white lab coat, the slide rule didn't do it. And I just wanted to mix a few things together and win the Nobel Prize. I just did not have the kind of patience that science requires. It requires skill and hard work, many hours in the lab and a lot of study, but careful, careful work where most of the time experiments fail and do not produce any good results. And you keep trying and trying and you're patient. And that was just not my personality. I wanted what I wanted right away. And so I was just mixing a few things together and that didn't work. And I would throw that out and start again, something else. And more miserable, as I said, as time went on. Now, what happened was that at this point I lost hope because there are kind of bad things that happen to alcoholics, and one of them is impatience. I didn't get just what I always wanted, and I want it right now. But far worse than that is getting what I always wanted and realizing, no, that's not it after all. Because once you get to that spot and that's not it, then where do you go from there? And so I was in that that hopeless state, and I was rescued by the second most powerful higher power that has come into my life. And of course, you know what that is, because this is a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was right there on the laboratory shelf. It was 90% ethanol. That's 180 proof drink, and it's mighty good, especially if you mix it with 7-Up from the vending machine. And we just enjoyed this reagent and uh and we'd drink and go out after work <laughs> work um to bars and there were wonderful bars in los angeles this was the 60s and it was the ore house with great big oars over the door and um a wonderful flamenco place where flamenco dancers jumped up on the table with castanets, and I drank black Russians there, black Russians and flamenco dancers, and I just thought, you know, I've always longed for international travel, and it just felt like I was doing it. Uh, Alcohol took me to a place that I had never even imagined. It was what I was looking for in science, really, that spiritual feeling of, of being just exactly where I wanted to be. And I came to love beer because I was a fast drinker. And that would get me there and keep me there for quite a while, even though I drank it fast. And it also uh, had another wonderful side benefit in that I didn't dry out. I mean, I used to drink vodka real fast or bourbon and then wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning just parched. And I would run to a faucet and hold my head under it and try to, to get hydrated again. It was like, you know, I just imagined as I'd wake up just completely parched, I'd have these pictures of these long insects, I guess they were some kind of roaches, that I'd find behind a desk, lying on their backs with their legs all curled up. That's how it felt after drinking for a long evening. And with beer, there's so much water in it that I just never got to that state. Also, I could stop eating now because there was so much sugar in beer that, I mean, it was an all-purpose drink, food, drink, and alcohol, the spiritual drink that took me to there, that, that wonderful place. And because it was so gratifying, so wonderful, I moved quite a bit of beer into the lab, and I... Uh, kept it in a refrigerated room, and we had this great big room that we could walk into. I guess it's kind of like a meat locker. I mean, you could actually walk into it, 
and we had lab benches there and you could do experiments and keep all the cold stuff, stuff that needed to be kept cold. And and so I redesigned my experiment. I was working on muscle protein, so I changed it to muscle protein at low temperatures. And so I could just move right into the cold room. And I'd put on a parka in the morning and heavy mittens, and I'd go in and try to do careful work with mittens on. <laughs> ah, Mittens still allowed me to pop open beer cans. And really, that's all I needed to feel like I'm doing the best work of my life. And the Nobel Prize is ever so close. I thought when I was sitting there in the cold with my parka and my beer and hours would go by and I'd go out and warm up by the coffee pot. And now I could talk with my lab mates before I just never had that language that other people had. I had no idea what was being said. I Half the time I was in a blackout by afternoon, but but it was a wonderful time, and it went on for a long time. Now, if you pay taxes, you may be happy to know that in those days, money flowed freely in science, but that's not true anymore. Uh, tax money going to science is very well spent. My daughter is a scientist, and she's a successful scientist, and she works hard to get grants to support her research. And she and her colleagues make very good use of the grants they get. So money is well spent. And uh, it's been a source for me to try to make amends because I just squandered a really wonderful opportunity and ran up a big tab there uh, with no way to pay it back except in sobriety by making amends. And, um, And so it went on for a couple of years until the director um, instead of his usual, he'd ask, how are you doing? And I'd always say, really fine, just fine. Do you need any help? He would ask, no, I'm just fine. Thank you. Just great results. And, um, uh, and he'd go away and talk to other people. And one day, instead of asking what I'm doing, he just said, it's time to write it up, Marilyn. And that was the kiss of death. I thought to myself, he is asking for something. And I can't provide that because I could not think of anything publishable, anything that would count as scientific results. And so I just went home and sat on the couch and felt sad and drank beer. And after a few months, I mailed the keys back. And the years that followed were deep and terrible despair. Um, I'd lost complete control of my life. I was doing nothing but drinking. Bill didn't notice a lot at first because he was working hard to establish his career. And he worked all day in the lab, would come home and hope that there would be some dinner. And then go back to work. And then I went out, got more to drink and just drank. Now, during that time, as I said, I'd lost control of my life, and our house seemed to fill up with little children. Now, I didn't know how to put a stop to that. In fact, I hardly knew how it was happening, but it was happening. And it seemed like there were ever so many of them. Um, Bill came home one night, and I was out getting more beer. And he was pulling open the car door saying, what is wrong with you? And I knew that something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. But I just didn't have an answer. I tried to figure it out. How how did this happen? This is bad. I seem to have crashed the car against the curb in some way or maybe a pole. And it wasn't moving. And, and Bill was saying, I came home and the front door was wide open and the baby was in her crib and you've got two children in the back seat and there were no seat belts in those days. And somehow we got home and a few days later, his mother moved in. He was a man of action. He saw the danger that the family was in and uh, invited his mother to come in and take control of the situation. And of course I loathed and hated her because she replaced me and and I just took to my garage and drank and every now and then she would give me encouragement 
And somehow she knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. It was encouragement like, unless you shape up and stop drinking, we're going to lock you up and you'll never see the children again. I mean, <laughs> she scared me to death. Uh, you can imagine the hatred. I didn't have the word resentment, but that was the source of much resentment on my <laughs> first two or three inventories. Um, and um, and yet I look back on that. There was a guy, Keith, Keith C., in my, my home group early on. And he had this, this prayer that used to make, God, let me accept the seemingly good and the seemingly bad as necessary for my recovery and for my relationship with you. And that was seemingly bad, but ultimately it turned out to be seemingly good because it's largely because of her that I made that call to Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was a person, Lorena, who probably got up that morning and her primary purpose was to stay sober and to help the suffering alcoholic. And so she probably said a prayer, dear God, keep me sober and help me be of use today to the suffering alcoholic. And she got a 12-step call, and it was, would you visit this crazy drunk? Her name is Marilyn, and she seems to be in need of help. And she came to my house and said she'd take me to a meeting that night. And off we went to a dark, quiet meeting, which I requested. And... Uh, there was a woman, Marion W., who was the main speaker that night, and she told my story. She talked about an unhealthy dependence on her husband, who was no longer her husband, but she talked about being dragged around the kitchen holding onto his ankles. And I just pictured myself fiercely dependent on these few adults in my life, but really hating them, too, because of my complete dependence on them, my weakness. And she talked about that, and she talked about fear. She was afraid of the wind. Well, I was afraid of sunshine. I thought sun was coming in to poison us all. And so after the meeting, and it's astonishing that I heard that whole talk, because I was just coming out of a long period of very heavy drinking, very foggy. And yet I heard that talk. And I ran up and I just, what it seemed like was I dropped to the floor and grabbed her ankles and I said, would you be my sponsor? And she agreed to do that if I went to her home group, which happened to be the big Pacific group in West Los Angeles with a fearsome leader, Clancy I, who I'm sure many of you have met. And uh, then I'd heard about that group. And... Uh, uh, through futile trips into the fellowship before at the urging of my mother-in-law. But this time I heard the wonderful Marianne W. And she said, if I would come to the Pacific group, and I said, I can't do that because I'm a scientist, I told her. And she got a good laugh out of that. And she said, well, then I can't be your sponsor. But I had already attached. I had really dug in deep. And... I said, okay, even that. Again, the seemingly bad, but absolutely necessary for my recovery. A big active group full of enthusiasm. And in those days, uh, it was smaller. It was about uh, somewhere between 250 and 275 members. And full of enthusiasm, we met at a small meeting hall, Ohio Street, and sat on the everywhere on the floor, on the shelf where they serve food, on the backstop where they put out literature, um, on, in each other's laps, um, and everybody in the room was smoking. And it was fun. Uh, gosh, I just was taken up into sobriety. Um, I I wanted to please Marion, and that was not a the great, greatest motive in the world, but but it got me to do what she was asking me to do. And really what she was asking me to do was come early to the meetings, get involved in the fellowship, take commitments at all the meetings I go to. She suggested seven and go to the yard, Clancy's backyard on the weekend where they play team sports and have a horrid lunch. They call it the mystery meat luncheon. 
And in the days of Clancy, that went on year after year after year after year. And uh, and it was so painful at first because they told me I had to play volleyball. And I said, I don't know how to play volleyball. And they said, start playing and you will learn. <laughs> it was just backward where you go to the university and you study for eight years and then maybe you can play volleyball or whatever. Um, you learn by doing. And that was a lesson in sobriety. I began to learn life by living it and making mistakes. And I had to make my first hundred or thousand or 10,000 mistakes um, before I realized that it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. We've got a step that even addresses that. Our 10th step says, continue to take personal inventory. And when wrong, promptly admitted it. So we can do that. And uh, I make them every day now. Um, And it's a real freedom to know that that's okay. I remain a member in good standing in my my fellowship as long as I I admit when I'm wrong. Um, I learned a lot of things from Clancy, even though I studied him from a distance. Um, Jerry had mentioned uh, we do what we say we're going to do. Clancy would say something to the effect that spirituality is being where you say you're going to be and doing what you say you're going to do. That's a lot of spirituality. It's a commitment to others and a commitment to our program, a commitment to meetings. Um, And I learned so much from Marion, but she said she was going to move away uh, before my first year was up. Her husband had taken a job in another city. And I said, Marion, don't, don't. I can't stay sober if you move away. Oh, yes, you can, she said. And I said, please, take me with you. And she said, Marilyn, that's ridiculous. You've got a family here. You have to make amends to them. And you need to stay here in this home group. And I said, at least be my sponsor and I'll call you every day. And she said, no, Marilyn, you're too intense. You need to have a sponsor in your home group. And I said, there will never be another Marion. Now I was right about that because it was time to break some of those unhealthy dependencies. And over these many, many years that I've been kept sober is that I've never been able to break those dependencies on my own. I just attach and hang on. And uh, and yet they're broken for me uh, one way or the other. And each time that happens, there is a transfer. And when Marion moved away, I never found another Marion, but I've had other sponsors and they have been wonderful. But it's not that fearsome kind of parasitic dependency where I just live for those pats on the head. Um, I want direction and I'm grateful for it, but I am much more of a grown up in those relationships. Each time a dependency is broken and each time a little bit gets transferred to the fellowship as a whole or to my higher power. Now, how did I get to know my higher power? Well, that was through envy, another character defect. I envied the great Chuck Chamberlain because he had something really wonderful in his relationship with a higher power. And I wanted that. And I took the steps. But also, I said a prayer, which was kind of the third step and seventh step, rolled together in intent. And that was, if you're there, I'd like to get to know you. I'd like to have experience of you. And if you're really there, I am willing to go on any path you pick for me. And it made my heart beat fast because I felt, oh my gosh, I'm signing it all away. Well, little did I know at that time, the transformation had already occurred. I'd given my will in my life and the care, to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was my higher power for quite a while. God acting through the fellowship, much as we say in our second step and second tradition, a loving God as he expresses himself in our group conscience. I believe as he expresses himself in our fellowship, expresses himself amongst our fellows, 
And because I had turned my will and my life over to the care of the fellowship, of the program, uh, I was coming into that relationship and had already given it over. So the next step was saying to something that I didn't even know was there, if you're there, I want experience of you, and I am certainly willing to go on any path. Now, I expected loud music and maybe a chariot with flames coming out of it, coming down from the heavens. Here, Marilyn, we've come to take you to the fourth dimension. (laughs) Ah, I was disappointed. Uh, Nothing happened. (laughs) However, something did happen, really, because in the year that followed, I underwent what's, it's on page 27 in our big book. I I refer to that a, a lot. I don't know pages in the big book for the most part, but that one I do know because that's where Carl Jung is talking about Roland, the hopeless case, and saying that he had hoped to bring about spiritual awakening. And that involved deep emotional displacements and rearrangements. Old ideas are swept away, replaced by new ideas. And he couldn't, as as great as he was, the greatest psychologist of all time there in Europe, certainly one of the greatest, he could not bring that about in Roland, this hopeless, hopeless drunk who was dying of alcoholism. And, and yet that's what he knew it would take. He had that foresight. And that is what we get when we take these steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and involve ourselves in the fellowship. It brings about these deep emotional displacements and rearrangements Our personalities are remade, and these unresolved pains, griefs, guilts are brought to the surface and resolved. Apparently, I stored up a lot of emotion about father being in a coma all those years. Couldn't experience emotion at the time when I was a kid. It was just too mysterious and horrible. But in sobriety, I I think I kind of relived that and and went through a, a grief, a period of grief for many things, but resolution of grief and ironing out of resentment, all of those deep emotions in co-age, you know, hard to put words on that needed resolution. And as that period ended, then a veil parted and I came into contact with a God of my very own. And for me, it was kind of a sudden thing that in one moment, I was blind to it. And then the veil parted and it was, "Ah, you've been there all along, haven't you? And it was a realization and I could see it and I could experience it. And it has stood me in good set ever since. And in the years that that followed, uh, that was the living out of this, this program because I had taken the steps and then we're told, practice these principles in all your affairs. And uh, try to seek a deeper relationship with your higher power. What I was ignoring was that essential part of the 12th step, which was to be totally involved in service and helping others. And I was using the first 11th steps as a self-help program. It's a very good self-help program. I mean, it really irons the kinks out of our personalities. And it fits us for the real world so that we can go out and we can appear as normal, I mean, healthy, normal people, productive citizens. But what it did for me was it it got peace in the family, which was good. I made a living amends forever to my family. But I went back to work. I went back to school first and finished the degrees I'd started and then went to work. And I was working in a career that was, was fun. But pretty soon, those character defects from steps six and seven that had been tucked away in like the character defect cedar chest, the door was coming open and they were creeping out again. And it was finding a lesser power. And that was money, property, (laughs) prestige, wanting a bigger house, a better car, a better job, more money, all of these lesser, lesser powers leading to a lesser life. And the more I pursued these ends, the less contented I was. 
thank God I stayed tied to meetings. I kept going to meetings and I stayed involved in the fellowship. Um, I talked to other people. I had friends. Um, and, and yet I was without a sponsor for quite a few years. When I was 18 years sober, I was in Israel with young daughter Susie. And she had gone there to live on a kibbutz for a while. Uh, and while I was there, I was actually s- sitting on a rock at the Sea of Galilee, this big historical sea, and looking at the water and thinking about the history associated with Israel, with the temple, with the Sea of Galilee, and thinking, I'm not a happy person. I should be happy. But the program has not given me all of those promises that are talked about after step nine, eight and nine. And I realized that the people that were happy were ones that were practicing the full part of step 12, namely being of service and helping the suffering alcoholic, really devoting themselves to others, throwing themselves into the fellowship as I had not been doing. And I apologized to my higher power, and I said, I want what they have. And I realized it meant being of service. And I knew that the character defects had already come out of the closet, and one of my favorites had always been sloth. (laughs) And so how could I be of service? I'm way too lazy. Um, So I thought, well, I'll, I'll throw myself into Calcutta, and I'll turn myself over to Mother Teresa. Uh, Susie, my daughter, who's not an alcoholic, certainly not in a 12-step program, listened to that, and she said, that's interesting. Why don't you confer with maybe some of your AA friends when we get back home? (laughs) Maybe that's right, but um, why don't you talk to them? Which I did, and they kind of had the same reaction. That's interesting. You say you you heard the voice of God telling you to go to Calcutta. Well, I mean, it's what came to mind when I made the prayer to be of service. And they said, well, probably you heard God, but as with foreign movies, sometimes the translation is a little off. So maybe, maybe what, God was saying was, why don't you get more active in Alcoholics Anonymous? I mean, there's plenty of work to be done there. And the way to do that was to return to my birthplace, and that was the Pacific Group. So I went back when I was 18 years sober, and uh, at that point, uh, I didn't have a sponsor. And Mary M. kept saying, you need a sponsor, and it needs to be Clancy. Well, that's really was terrifying. Um, But she kept after me, and one day I just asked him if I could talk to him, and I I went down to the mission where he worked, the Midnight Mission in Los Angeles, to have a chat with him, and ended up asking if he would consider sponsoring me. And he said he thought that 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 would probably work, um, that I should go to the big Wednesday night meeting every Wednesday. I thought he was going to assign me all kinds of stuff, but... um, But it really was that meeting that he always went to. I had to go to a lot of other meetings, uh, try to go to the meetings of the group. It was just one of those things. I think it's in some kind of holy book, but God, when you my yoke is easy. (laughs) And that was hitching my yoke to Clancy. My yoke is easy. Just follow me. Try to do what I'm doing. Well, that was quite an assignment. I mean, nobody could keep up with Clancy. But I was thrown back into the Pacific group. And I didn't have to put myself into service because I just had to go to a meeting and somebody would say, hey, do you want to go with me on my panel? It's only a 90-mile drive to Bakersfield. Um, Can you stay after the meeting and scrape the chewing gum off the bottom of the seats? Can you go to the lockup ward with me this weekend? Um, Boy, you just are instantly into service by simply being present and saying yes. 
And pretty soon I began to sponsor people. And that has become a huge and rewarding part of my program. I love my sponsees and they keep me uh, tied to the program more than anything else. The thought of ever having a drink and having to tell my sponsees, you know, I went out drinking last night. (laughs) It's the most unimaginable nightmare that a human could have. Um, And also, I try to keep up with them. I tell them um, to go to lots of meetings. I have to go to lots of meetings. Tell them to say yes to all AA requests. So I have to do that. And, uh, And that works. And just by doing that, I was drawn into that thing that the other people were doing. And my life began to fill up with all kinds of joy. And it was there when I needed it. At 40 years of sobriety, I got the kind of news that nobody ever should get. And that was that our beloved son, David, who had grown into what seemed like a happy, very productive, wonderful young man, an elite athlete and a scientist, uh, newly wed, hanged himself in his office one Friday night. Now, why did that happen? I'll never know. He did not leave a note. Maybe it was some kind of moment of insanity, but it shattered the family. It certainly shattered me. And, uh, and I was out of town speaking in Las Vegas at State Line when it happened. And luckily, Clancy was there, my sponsor. And uh, and I called him. And he was grumpy at first because it was near midnight. And Clancy could be grumpy. But when he heard what I was going through, he stepped into his phone booth, as Superman always did took off the outer clothing with a great big S on his chest, sponsor, and became that sponsor that whose words were like a hypnotic suggestion. And he said, you have 40 years of sobriety. This is what you need to do. You need to drive home tonight and comfort your husband and be strong for your family. And it's going to be a hard couple of years, but you will get them through it and you will be held in good stead by your higher power and by this fellowship. And that gave me the strength and the courage to get in the car and drive across the desert for five hours. And luckily, I could listen to the great Sandy Beach because um, his daughter, two daughters, had died the year before, one to our disease and the other was murdered in her front yard. And he had those words. You have time to react, he said. Go out to your higher power and you form that bond as never before. And when you do begin to react strongly, guess who comes back with you? And I can test to the truth of that. And uh, and that was the beginning. And the two years were hard and grief-filled. But I was elected president of the uh, Lifelong Learning Institute where I was teaching science. A wonderful distraction. And I said yes to that. And the family grew ever closer. Sometimes that kind of thing can split a family apart. But we just simply grew closer and we listened to one another. And over 10 years has passed and uh, have passed and there has been great healing. And there is much joy in my life, believe it or not. Even through two more losses, my husband passed away a few two years ago. And, of course, we lost our Clancy August 24th uh, in the year past, a year and a half ago now. And uh, those, those are sad, but they were in the natural order of things. These were people living a full and good life and then transitioning to what lies beyond. And so there was not the kind of grief and sadness that we had for David, for our son. But even that left a void. And... I'm a great believer in sponsorship. And two weeks after Clancy left, I was at a retreat given by uh, Father Tom W. in Oakland. And I've been kind of a groupie forever with him. Uh, He gives great retreats. And um, there's one this weekend, a virtual retreat, which I will go to tonight because it's still early in Los Angeles. And that starts that retreat. 
And so he was at the retreat and he was, was singing some to illustrate some points, like don't try to do the impossible, like the serenity prayer. Accept what you can't change and change what you can. And so he sang that song from Man from La Mancha, dream the impossible dream. You can dream it, but don't try to do the impossible. And he sang another song to illustrate a point. <laughs> and, uh, and then out of the blue, he said, you know, I'll sponsor anyone. They don't call me, but I'll sponsor them. And a light bulb went off, and that was my cue. So after his session, I thought, well, I guess you have to do this in song. So, so I sang the Mr. Rogers song. It's a wonderful day in this fellowship, a wonderful day for sponsorship. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my sponsor? Now, he had said, I'll sponsor anyone. <laughs> and so he sort of had to say yes. So he's been my sponsor now for a year and a half, I guess it's been. And that has, has been a, a wonderful thing because I sponsor people and I love to be accountable to a sponsor. Uh, so I just find that the gifts of Alcoholics Anonymous just keep keep giving. And my life gets ever richer as time goes by. Um, just made a trip to Egypt, a pleasure trip with four other members of the fellowship. And uh, and that was great fun, seeing God working in Alcoholics Anonymous there and seeing pyramids and riding a camel. At this advanced age, <laughs> there are still great adventures. So do not be afraid to grow old. It just gets better every year. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.